Hey guys, we are going to get started <clears throat> with chapters 11 and 12. Um, here's the textbook that we're going to be kind of walking through as we uh, run through these two chapters, doing a little bit of hands-on work for your reference. Um, additionally, I've uh, got some HTML notes for you over here. And by the way, just as a refresher, the last video we were talking about HTML and CSS. So notice when I have opened these notes, I have actually both of these files open. I have the HTML file and I also have the CSS file. We are at a stage in this course where we are always talking about those two things in a collaborative manner. And so we need those two documents communicating. Um, the communication is established, and this is, again is review from the last video, with this line of code in the head portion of the document, link, yada, yada, yada. And then of course there is the, um, the path that leads to the styles.css. Uh, so you can see that I have this style sheet living in a CSS folder, and the the document is literally called styles, which you can see right here. Okay. Um, if I were to change this, I would break the communication and all of this work that I've been doing here, it, it wouldn't connect and it wouldn't operate correctly. And so these are all examples that we're going to walk through um, in the course of this lecture tutorial. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, the, we introduced color a little bit in the last tutorial, of course. We started making text a certain specific color. I was showing you that just to kind of get you excited about this connection between CSS and HTML and how, um, how it can be uh, used to just essentially make things look a little bit more than just bare bones, all right, or structural. Um, Even when you're painting, there's a foreground and a, back, and a background. And in general, in visual art, you can consider it this way. You know, there's a foreground and there's a background. And you can consider things like contrast and the experience that you want the user to have. Even if it's someone looking at a drawing or a painting in a gallery, you want to direct their eye to be able to see something or look at something and to see it clearly. Um, so when you're choosing your colors, be mindful of that. You know, I've I've talked about that in previous videos where those two colors with the foreground and the background, they didn't have enough contrast. And so it was essentially hard on the eyes. It was hard on the user's eyes. Um, so keep that in mind, all right? User experience when you're choosing these colors. Um, we've already talked about, here's the type selector that we uh, discussed in the previous lecture where we take a tag or a type and uh, we just simply give it a color, okay? There are three different ways that you can identify color through CSS. And by the way, we're looking at CSS right now. This is not HTML, this is CSS. And so on the, H on the corresponding HTML document, there is a simple line of code for the H1, there's a simple line of code for the H2, and there's a simple line of code for the paragraph text. But they are all being told to be a separate color or a distinct color in three unique ways. Here, you can just type out the name, and it's really nice in brackets. It'll kind of finish the code for you a little bit. Um, and so when you guys get a chance to start practic practicing this on your end, you'll see that. The other way that you can do it is with a hex code, okay? And um, it's basically six numbers or letters that indicate a very particular color, a very specific color. Um, and then there's RG. This, by the way, hex codes are very particular or um, it's very web-based, okay? So it's a way to, to type in code with CSS to render again, a specific color, but it's it's very um, web-based. 
we can come down here and there's another way to render color um, on a screen. And of course, uh, computer screens, all the color on your computer screen is essentially re rendered through the combination of red, green, and blue. And so these three corresponding numbers, red, green, and blue, are, are just simple ratios to, um, to churn out those colors or that particular color, okay? I wanted to show you guys something else really quickly. So um, this doesn't necessarily pertain to web design, but it does indeed pertain to uh, graphic design. And so if you've taken an Illustrator course with me or Digital Media 1 or 2, then you've already been using Illustrator and this will look familiar to you. If you haven't taken an Illustrator course with me, Digital Media, maybe you want to in the future. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, but I have Illustrator open here, and this is actually a document that I'm working on for a project. And all I did was I simply extracted this blue and this purple in these two squares up here. And then uh, if you go to Essentials Classic, is my is, that's my preferred way of looking at things, and you can... Um, Reset Essentials Classic down there. Then you click on this little artboard guy right there. If I click on, I also want to say show options. There we go. If I click on this purple, it's going to give me that hex code right there. Okay. Additionally, it's going to give me that R, G, and B ratio or combination to render that specific purple. Similarly, I can click on another color. So now I'm currently I have, you can see I have purple engaged here. I have it selected. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to engage blue. And notice how the numbers have changed. Okay. And also the, the, everything has changed. The RGB ratio, everything has changed. So you can use Adobe Illustrator or most Adobe applications to sort of derive those colors if necessary that you can plug into your uh, website, okay? So I just wanted to show that to you briefly. And of course, any reason to, um, to bring up Illustrator in a class is a good one if you ask me. Anyone who's taken a class with me before knows how much I love Illustrator. So foreground color is essentially just making the text a specific color. And next thing I want to do is I kind of want to go over to, I want to open up this notes.html file, but I want to open it in my browser. Um, I've got a lot of windows open here. My bad folks, hold on one moment. It's a bad habit. Okay. So we're currently on <clears throat> project six. And if we back up into my project six folder, I have an entire folder dedicated to notes HTML dash six. Um, and so I can click into that. And again, here's that CSS folder with that style sheet, which is connected right here, okay? And I have an images folder the truth is I'm not actually using any of these images for this particular project. So I'm actually going to delete those. You guys might not be deleting your photos, but I'm trying to keep file sizes small for folks who want to download this for reference. That's why I just deleted that. Um, and here's this notes.html file, the one that we're looking at right here. I'm going to open that, not in brackets, but in a browser. And my preferred browser is Google Chrome. Okay. So there it is right there. This is the rendered file. And you can see it has, um, if we go to the style sheet, we can see that I've given the whole entire body of this website a background color of light gray right here. And that's pretty evident. <clears throat> um. But talking about foreground colors, uh, there are three, there, there are two examples here. Um, one is using that RGB method that I was just discussing with you. And the other one is using the hex method. And so I've also included some comments here for your review. And so these three numbers actually uh, using the RGB ratio they equate to powder blue or a light blue. 
and you can kind of see it's actually very difficult to see against that light gray which by the way would be a bad user experience but again this is just a tutorial okay sometimes it's actually useful to see bad examples to know why it's important to have better contrast on the screen <clears throat> so but again that light blue is being rendered by one two three red green blue those three numbers right there okay the second uh, piece of text, this header five text has a foreground color of green. Okay, and I'm actually using um, a hex system to render that green. Okay, so that's foreground. Now, what about the background? Here is some header six text that has a background color of orange. Background color orange and here I'm specifying all h6s within this document will have that background color. I don't want all of my headers to have a background color which is why I chose that smaller h6 which seems to be even smaller than paragraph text right It is bold but it's even smaller than paragraph text kind of interesting. Um, let's go back to our textbook here. So we've talked about foreground color. We've talked about different ways to render or code the color um, systems. Um, we've talked about background color. Um, I believe that a, a color theory class is required uh, for your degree, most likely, but this look, should look pretty familiar, R, G, B. Okay, and of course, um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, okay, folks. Uh, I just talked about R the three ways to render uh, colors on the screen. That's RGB values, hex codes, and then the simple color names. We're familiar with those three ways. Uh, we talked about contrast and user experience. Um, very, very useful. Opacity is something that I'm not gonna cover real tightly within this uh, tutorial because I don't, in all honesty, I don't think it's all that useful in web design. Um, for example, if you want to make a gray uh, text, you could choose a black text and then reduce the opacity and then kind of have that particular range of gray. Or you can just choose a gray or a light gray. And so I think it's more advantageous, honestly, just to know what color you want and to use it. But if you do want to just play around with opacity, the code is here for you, okay? And it is just kind of fun and nifty to do that. It's it's much more useful to use opacity in a program like Illustrator, where you're doing digital illustration and you're creating graphics and things are on separate layers that are interacting with each other. On a computer screen, that rarely happens, uh, in my world at least. If you, If you can think of a good way that that might work uh, for your resume or CV project, by all means. Uh, we're not going to talk about H HL uh, HSL colors, okay? Uh, I think that these three methods are absolutely plenty for the time being. Moving on, uh, that pretty much covers everything I want you to know in chapter 11. And it, it can really be summarized uh, again with these three uh, commands on the CSS file, which are directly talking to the H4, the H5, and the H6 lines of code that are currently on um, the, H, uh, the HTML file over here. And they're H4, H5 right there, and then the H6, okay? So just kind of creating that, um, that reference for you all. Um, moving on, the next chapter is all about text and doing, essentially discovering some new techniques that might be useful as you're, um, as you're making your CV or resume. And I've really kind of gone through and I've gathered all the examples that I think are most relevant. I pulled them out for you and given you some code um, to review and look at and copy and paste and use. Uh, again, I support copy and pasting uh, in this class. That's uh, HTML is democratic. 
HTML and CSS is democratic and universal. You're not stepping on anyone's toes or doing anything wrong when you cut and paste code because it's standard practice. Okay, folks? There's no magical way to do this from your own unique perspective, um, which is sometimes kind of reassuring. Uh, the, the real way that you can make uh, a web page unique is through your own decision making, like user experience decision making, and deciding what kind of content is going to work best to give folks a good web experience. For example, choosing really good strong, strong images that represent a, a painting that you did really well or a drawing that you did really well. Um, in my drawing and uh, 2D classes, I talk about this a lot. You really have to, you have to do your best to capture or photograph those drawings and paintings in natural light so the color is accurate and so that everything is in focus. We're getting a little bit off base, but I mean, the truth is a lot of folks are seriously considering making a portfolio website so that they can get shows at galleries or so that they can um, apply to graduate school after they get their BFA. Um, it's up to you. Moving right along, I think that, I mean, everyone knows this because you've used Microsoft Word and what you can actually style words in Microsoft Word with, you know, light, you can have it normal, you can have it ital italicized, you can make text oblique, you can make it bold. I think this shouldn't be anything new to anyone here. Uh, but I think some of this language here might be inter interesting just to kind of review briefly, because if you're um, a BFA graphic design major, eventually we are going to be taking typography together. Um, this is fun. Uh, serif means foot in French. Sans serif means without foot in French. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit, actually, so that you guys can see this really, really clearly. But notice how the text or the fonts, rather, on the left-hand side, they're more fancy. They're more ornamental. They're more, um, uh, if you guys have taken an, taken an art history class, um, they're more Baroque. Okay, they're more extravagant. Um, you can see, look at the way that this G kind of flanks out here at the top, um, or the way this A kind of like curls around, rounds out, you know, and kind of reach, reaches out, actually. So th there are a lot of interesting uh, things happening with this, with these fonts to take a note of. And that's because they're serif fonts, okay? Um, on the right-hand side are sans serif fonts, and essentially they're more modern, simplified, um, they're less rounded, um, uh, they're more direct. They're going to, the, the important thing to take notice here is that these fonts are most likely going to, um, they're going to render more clearly on a computer screen. Because remember, a computer screen is a bunch of pixels. And so if there's a lot of rounded, detailed business happening with a font, the screen is only going to be able to go so far rendering those extreme details. Um, I think that a screen has a much easier time rendering these fonts, but furthermore, they just look better and more clear to the user's eye. So if, especially if it's a small font, if it's like 12 p uh, px, 12 pixels, which is standard, then I would definitely use a more modern sans serif font. Sometimes for a header, you you can dis, you can also start creating hierarchy uh, within your web pages by choosing a serif font for one of your headers or all of your headers, and then you can choose a sans serif font for your paragraph text because it's going to read really clearly, but it's also going to be smaller on the screen. Header, uh, generally a header is going to be larger on a screen and paragraph text is going to be smaller on a screen. So that's why that's an important thing to kind of take note of. All right, guys. Um, we're, this is self-explanatory. I'll let you guys make your own decisions <laughs> and review that information. But I think having this discussion about serif and sans serif is plenty. Um, 
moving on, moving on, folks. Uh, specifying a typeface with the font family command. If we go over to my style sheet that I've, I've given and delivered to you, you're going to see that I've cast a broad command with the body tag up here. I, I've basically said any text within the body of this HTML document is going to be Arial. If Arial is not available, available, Helvetica. If Helvetica is not available, then any sans serif. And so that's me using this font family command, okay? And I'm doing it in the body portion of the document. Notice how I also um, gave the background color that light gray within the body portion of the document. Um, if we go back and look at that, you can see, yes, Arial is indeed being used. And I, I discussed this in a previous video, Arial and Helvetica are very closely connected. Arial is always on a PC, okay, and Mac, actually, to my knowledge. Um, but Helvetica is not always on a PC, okay? And that's why I'm starting with Arial, because you have to consider the user. I mean, uh, not everyone has a Mac like me. In fact, a lot of the folks that are taking this class or, or reviewing these videos, you may not have a Mac. And so your browser will be rendering everything in Arial most likely. Okay. So back to brackets, um, to the textbook actually. So that's a really simple but useful command that you'll be using essentially on any and all websites, HTML websites that you create in this course, okay? Uh, so size of type, uh, pretty handy. And if we go to my notes.html, I'm trying to format this as clearly as possible for you guys. So we are on chapter 12 text. Obviously, that this command for the font family is in the body portion of the document. And so um, it's sort of an overall um, uh, issue that is happening with the website. It's not specific to a particular line of code, and we've discussed that. The next thing that we're going to talk about is size of type, okay? and or font size. And for each of these examples, I've kind of used the same text so that you can essentially have a standard to work with and also see the difference really clearly and all the, the operational moves, the operational HTML moves that we're going to be making. So you can, again, sort of compare apples to oranges. Um, I'm also using the class command right here. And then for each of these unique circumstances, I'm creating a unique class um, identifier. So class equals font size, class equals font units, class equals font dash weight. And by the way, when I'm usually when I'm coding, I always keep things lowercase. It's just a habit. It's good practice, frankly. And I like to use these dashes between words. Never, ever just leave a blank. In this kind of a circumstance, always use a dash, please, and thank you. That's just good practice. You just kind of learn it over the years. You know, you learn it uh, through mentors. You you learn it through working in an office. Um, this is kind of a crash course in HTML, uh, but as you as you've kind of figured out at this point, you really get really good at this when you practice it, when you do it. Listening to this lecture and just reading the textbook, it's not enough. You have to sit down and try it and then see how it works. So font size, uh, let's go back and see how, so here's the class for font size. Let's find the CSS command for font size. And here you can see within, a par within paragraph text that has the class command font dash size, okay, 20 px, all right, so let's see how that's looking on the screen, this is some example text, I think.
font size and I upped it to 20 pixels. That's why it's a little bit bigger compared to like the standard 12 pixel pixels, right? Um, font units. I've done the same thing on the next line, except I've made this font size 300%. Okay. And there's the command right there. See that? Moving on. Font weight, normal or bold. I chose to use bold here. Okay. So you can kind of see that this text is indeed strong or bold. Okay. And it's through that command right there. The next one is uppercase or lowercase. You can see here's the command right there, text transform uppercase. And if we go back and look over here, it's kind of fun. You can see that this text is not uppercase. It's just normal text. But I came over here and said, hey, make all of that uppercase and indeed, it's all uppercase because of that command. Underline and strike. Uh, here it is again, text decoration. Underline. What do you know? The text is underlined. Letting is an important function, especially if you guys take a publication design class with me at some point. Um, and we're using a different unit here, 1.4 EMs. Okay, so that's important to kind of start just start familiarizing yourself with um, with that term or that unit rather. We've used pixels, we, we've used percentage. Now we're gonna start using these EMs as well. Okay, line height. And that's why there's a little more space. Okay, you can just kind of see some breathing room. If I change this to two, you're gonna see even more breathing room above and below that text. Uh, word spacing or kerning. Uh, it's all oftentimes called kerning. Uh, it's 0.2 EMs. That's the command that I've given it. And you can kind of see, look at the beautiful breathing space between the letter forms. That's a lot of fun. And I'm just doing that with simple HTML code and CSS right here. Here's the CSS command. Uh, alignment. I have aligned this text so that it is right smack, it is right smack in the middle. And just for context, Right now we are right here. So here is, this is some example text. Here's the class called alignment, creating the communication. And here is the command telling that text to be right smack in the center. By the way, it's paragraph text. And then there's a class associated with that paragraph text. I'm creating that connection right here with that little period because that indicates class, right? We learned that in the last chapter. So dot and then alignment. That, that communication is happening because of that word being there. If we go to notes, alignment is right here. So that's creating some an additional layer of communication within the document. Essentially, I, I'm able to get very, very specific with a class and, I, and, and an ID, okay? Um, and so they can be very useful. Um, last, well, not last, we're all getting there though. Drop shadows. Uh, drop shadows are fun, but in my opinion, they're not very useful, okay guys? And so it does require just a little bit more code too. This is all of that drop shadow information. And you can play with the background color, the foreground color, and then the ac actual text shadow. And you can choose colors for all that business here. Um, but in my opinion, it just muddies the water. I It depends on what kind of a designer you are or how you want your, um, your content to read. But... Um, in my opinion, it's it's not all that useful, but I this is we're just kind of practicing in this class and having fun, and so I don't want you guys to shy away from trying a drop shadow just because I'm saying that, because we're just having fun in this class. But I do want you guys to start to develop um, some some sort of sense of um, 
design identity you know you know how do you want your design to uh to appear on the screen or uh, on the page or or in general uh, you're developing your personal design voice uh, even if you're a beginner <clears throat> Last thing I wanted to show you guys, it's a lot of fun. You can uh, style links that are uh, so that it's responsive to uh, the user experience. And so all of these different lines of code, here's the actual link itself, giving it a color. Um, if a user has visited this page, it's gonna be a particular color. If a user wants to just hover over the link with their cursor, it's gonna turn a certain color. Uh, all this stuff, okay? So let's give it a shot. Let's come over here. So if I take my cursor and I put it over this link, it's going to turn green. Okay. And I open this in a new page. And I think it should, in theory, kind of change because you've already visited or clicked on that link. It should turn a different color. I should have made it, um, I think, hot pink and deep pink is a little bit too close. And so that's not a great user experience. Um, so yeah, those are a little bit too close together. That's a darker pink, that's a lighter pink, but I think they're still a little bit too similar. Uh, but again, those are just things that you need to consider when you're, when you have user experience on your mind. You know, anyone can code guys. This is, as you found out, this is all really easy, but it takes a really, um, it takes an individual with an incredible design sense to make these nuanced decisions about color, okay? And how you want things to look. And also to sort of put yourself in the user's shoes and think, is this working? Are these colors working? Is this text legible? All of those questions, you know, you need to start kind of processing those as you work. Um, that's really it for this lecture. I know that um, I, I think everyone has been making fantastic progress. Um, and I'm really kind of looking forward to, to seeing how everyone experiments with color uh, and, and how far folks can take it to just simply have a lot of fun. Design isn't always all serious. Sometimes it's just fun. And we're just learning here. Um, so yeah, thank you, everyone.